How the wrists work in the golf swing is undoubtedly a subject that's getting more and more attention. And if you're listening to the commentary on this, one of the phrases you may have heard is that you need to have a bowed lead wrist. Well, today I'm gonna to talk about what a bowed lead wrist really is, what it does to the club face, and how some of it might actually help you, but too much of it could be a bad thing as well. So we need to understand the movement of this wrist in terms of the flexion, and extension range of motion that it can move in. And once we've done that, we can associate how the wrist moves with what it does to the club face. Because what it does to the club face is ultimately the most important part of the swing and how it affects your swing is in its entirety. The club face is absolutely king of the castle. And if you don't get the wrist angles correct, you're never gonna be a good golfer. So. We need to understand how these wrists work, how they're supposed to work, the ranges within which are acceptable, and then also to be able to flag and highlight when we've got this wrong and what we can do about it. I'm gonna stop the club here in my backswing and use the hack motion data on the screen here to understand the movement of this wrist, particularly in this flexion extension range, which is the twisting of the club. This lead wrist at the moment is relatively flat um, you'll see there that the numbers are hovering around zero negative three degrees means it's three degrees in flexion but mostly to the naked eye that's pretty flat and a flat wrist at this point in time with a neutral grip would constitute a club face that's pretty neutral as well. Now if I wanted to move my wrist into the maximum amount of extension that would be twisting the wrist or cupping the wrist as it's often referred to that's now into 37 degrees of extension You'll see how that's moved the club face into a very different condition. That's extremely open. If I was to retain this amount of extension and move the club back to the ball, 30, well, it's moved, even moved to more, 47, that's 42 degrees of extension, that club face is pointing wildly off to the right of my target. I would not be able to hit a functional shot with that amount of extension. Conversely, if I go to the same spot, and take that lead wrist now from again a very flat condition to one where I maximize the flex. This is the bowing that's being described in terms of how a good player might use their wrist. And that has the influence, as you can see, of closing the club face quite significantly. We're into 33 degrees of flex there. If I was to bring that club back down to the ball, it's gonna present the club now in the opposite fashion. Okay, the, the club is gonna be pointed more to the left and that's going to potentially hit shots that go to the left. So we need to be mindful of the fact that the twisting of the shaft while it's happening in every single swing still needs to be monitored and managed. Too much of either extension or flexion is going to produce a bad shot. So if an excessively bowed wrist is producing a closed club face which would hit the ball to the left, why is everybody telling you to have a bowed wrist? Well there is a reason behind it and if you stick with this you'll understand why. Twisting the wrist, as we said, tends to produce a more closed or stronger club face. The good thing about this alignment is that it then allows a golfer to come, in da come down towards the ball, present shaft lean, while still maintaining with this flexed wrist, the wrist there is flexed 20 degrees in this example, with a flexed wrist and a shaft lean, I still have a club face that's functional, meaning square. If I simply push the shaft more forwards without any consideration for the flexion or the extension, the twisting, if I simply just try to lean the shaft more forwards, this club face is now pointing significantly to the right. That is gonna hit a terrible shot off to the right. And so many of you are struggling with this because you get the club face into an open condition, you have the wrist too extended, and, in, and as a consequence of that, as you swing down to the golf ball, to avoid hitting the ball extremely to the right, which would be your only option from here should you continue to move the hands forward, everything stops and stalls, and then you have to ha flip the wrists at the last moment, producing an impact position that looks something like this with the hands behind the ball and adding loft to the club face, which is reducing your potential power. So the benefit of bowing the wrist and putting the club into a stronger condition is that you can then get the sequence in your downswing to be much more efficient 
and you can deliver significantly more club speed and ball speed into your shot, which ultimately equals more distance. Let's talk about some checkpoints you can look for in your backswing. Checkpoint number one here would be called P2, position two, where the shaft's parallel to the ground. And typically speaking, a neutral club face at this point, which is associated with a fairly neutral wrist at this point in time as well, like six or seven degrees of flexion. A neutral club face would be one where the leading edge is turned down slightly and more or less matches my spine angle as I, as I reach this point in time in my swing. So a club face that's more up where the leading edge is more vertical or even past that point in this, in this example, that would be a red flag. That would be a club face at this point in time which would be excessively open. And as we say, that would be associated with more of the extension. So if you see this club face when you video your swing, you're gonna to want to consider twisting the face down some. Then on the other end of this spectrum, we would have a, a club face that was more turned down. Again, associated with a wrist that was more flexed. If you're gonna err on the side of error, this would be my preference to be slightly too closed as opposed to slightly too open. So a checkpoint between the leading edge of your club at P2 matching your spine angle and it being slightly more turned down than that, maybe more or less pointing down towards the golf ball, that would be a window within which I would typically find acceptable. And at that point in time, I would say your wrist angles are working well, your club face is in a good place, and you're gonna be on track to be able to deliver this club in the most efficient and powerful way possible. However, I teach a lot of people that have a good looking club face and wrist angles at P2, and by the time they get to the top of the swing, everything goes wrong. And the biggest reason I see this happening is in golfers attempt to lengthen their swing, but lengthening, lengthening it incorrectly. They're lengthening the swing via excessive radial deviation, the hinging up of the wrist. But what people do not understand correctly is that the more you hinge your wrists up and down, the more up you hinge the wrist, the more extension you add to the wrist. And we already know that extension opens the club face. Here's a good example of that. Let me get to the top and show you what I mean. So I go to the top and at this point in time, I've got a relatively flat lead wrist from a flexion extension point of view, eight degrees of extension, which is, which is fine. Okay, and I've got 27, 28 degrees of radial deviation. That's this upward hinging or cocking of the wrist that you would potentially be familiar, familiar with that terminology. Now, we get to the top. If I try to lengthen my swing by adding more uh, radial, so I'm gonna add more wrist hinge, watch what happens to the extension number as I lengthen my backswing. I've hinged my wrists more and I've added a significant, uh, a quite significant number uh, of degrees of extension. So by lengthening my swing, which feels to me like I'm gonna potentially have more power, I've completely robbed myself of the club face control that I need. So that's the biggest difference I see between high handicap golfers who, tip, tip, who typically slice the ball and better players who are able to control the club face, hit straighter shots and even draw the golf ball. That's the biggest difference is in how they get the club from halfway back to the top, understanding that what we're really looking for here is for the lead wrist to be more or less flat, that extension number there at plus three effectively means my wrist is flat. With 25 degrees of radial deviation, if I add more radial deviation, I'm also getting more extension that's not gonna be good. So the checkpoints at the top for P4, P4 be the top of the backswing, you wanna see that the club face at this point in time, the club face matches the angle of the lead wrist and that the club face here is turned some 45 degrees to the ground, something less desirable, more cupped or extended. You see how this club face is twisted now and it's more pointing down towards the ground. The toe of the club is pointing down towards the ground. That would be a red flag. If you look at the top of your backswing and the club head, your club head is visible to the left side of the shaft here, that's a problem. 
What we want at the top is for the club face to be visible to the right hand side of the shaft and for the angle of that club face to be somewhere around 45 degrees, like I say, more or less matching your lead wrist angle. Now you could experiment with bowing the wrist more than that. This wrist condition would be associated with the most famous golfer who does this would be Dustin Johnson. Okay, and you'll see that that has the effect of actually now twisting that club face all the way to the point where the club face is now pointing up towards the sky. And that would be considered a closed club face, one that would produce shots that would typically go to the left. They would typically also have more power associated with them, but from a directional point of view, you'd be looking at something that goes more to the left. Now, is that a good thing? Well, hitting balls to the left probably isn't a good thing, but if you're somebody who hits the ball to the right habitually, perpetually, you never stop slicing these balls, then it's a great idea for you to feel maximum flexion at P2, twist the club down, maximum flexion, maximum bowing of the wrist at P4, and hit balls with that feel. And you'll start to reduce the amount you hit to the right, hopefully start to hit them straight, and even if you start to draw or overdraw a few balls, you're gonna begin your journey of, of eliminating the wrist angles that have been causing you so much problem for such a long time. Let me hit one with maximum twist, P2, maximum twist, flexion, bowing, P4, and then we'll see what we get. Twist the club face down, twist the wrist into flexion. That one's gonna hook a little bit, not, not tons, it's got some curve on it to the left there. But what I get there, the feeling I get there immediately is one of good contact. Because as the club face is stronger, I'm able to get the desired impact alignments in terms of shaft lean, having my weight forward, all the things that good players demonstrate. And they're able to demonstrate those movement patterns because, simply because their club face is in the right condition. Their club face is turned in the right place throughout the time and space of the swing. They're not needing to react and compensate for poor wrist angles. So it's your wrist angles that are causing all of the other things you see in your swing that you probably don't like. The stalling impact of your body, the early extension of standing up, the flipping of the wrists to try and square the club face, the chicken wing in the follow through. All of those can be attributed to poor wrist angles. So if you want to improve your swing, the first thing you need to get right is your wrist angles and club face control. So now you understand the importance of the wrist angles in the swing and how you should be moving them. The next step is for a plan of action. Make sure you get down into the description to check out further drills on the wrists that will help you unlock tour level wrist action and will ultimately allow you to realize your true golfing potential.